My name is Mark Lopetis, and I'm the Senior Editor of Semiconductor Manufacturing and Design, or SEMI-MD, and I'm here today at the Applied Materials Campus here talking to Rendir Thakur, and he's the Executive Vice President and General Manager of the Silicon Systems Group. Rendir, we're clearly at a very interesting point in the uh, semiconductor industry where we're seeing monumental changes and in various inflection points taking place. And among those, we're seeing clearly very interesting things happening in the foundries, where we're seeing in the foundries in, oh, not too long ago, being more conservative with their capex. Now we're seeing sort of a shift, and they're really taking more of the burden and spending you know, quite a bit more money in expenditures. Can you give us a kind of a handle as to what you're seeing in the market? I think the... Uh in the last two years especially, the uh, shift has been uh, towards the foundry uh, because of the end user demand has changed. You see the emergence of uh, smartphones uh, across the globe uh, as well as uh, uh, the mobility and connectivity becoming a, a bigger theme. Uh, a lot of the chip demand is driven uh, from the foundries. Uh, so we see this shift and uh, it, in fact, uh, is uh, uh, making our business very interesting from the uh, faster cycle time, uh, making sure that the emphasis on the uh, new devices is more towards the low power, uh, driving a different kind of performance. So it is uh, making a, a change at the architecture level, uh, and therefore foundry, the die sizes are bigger, uh, and uh, the technology drive has shifted to the foundry. So action, especially in the last two years, has been uh, around the foundries. Many of those challenges have been at the leading edge where the foundries have had to do more of the uh, heavy lifting, more of the R&D, and they're making monumental shifts in you know, going from perhaps planar to 3D finfets and uh, so on and so forth. What, what do you see as the biggest challenge for them for the foundries, that is, in this kind of new era that we're in, the mobile space. The big change uh, from the technology uh, and device shift standpoint is really around uh, going uh, and making the key inflection of high K-metal gate. Coming in at 32 and 28 nanometer, the high K-metal gate is the new uh, material, what used to be gate oxide for uh, the planner devices uh, decades ago. Uh, with this change, uh, what we see is uh, the architectural uh, changes uh, such as uh, uh, 3D type devices. We see uh, material changes where uh, the complexity overall has increased. And this is pervasive across all of the transistors. So it is giving opportunity of a uh, lot of high value problems uh, that are being created at the foundries. And uh, applied material is very well positioned, especially in the transistor space, uh, where uh, starting from epitaxy to the thermal budgets, implants, and deposition, we have a, a portfolio of products that's extremely suitable to, uh, to drive the uh, foundry new inflection and new challenges they are facing, uh, whether it is uh, on the 3D side or it is in the overall uh, device complexity side. The, the foundries seem to be making a somewhat uh, uh, gradual shift in terms of high K metal gates. I think their next biggest challenge is perhaps the move to 3D transistors vis-a-vis -vis FinFETs. Of course, one major logic vendor, of course, Intel has made that transition and the foundries now are looking at that kind of transition, are they, is the biggest challenge for them to accelerate the time to market for FinFETs, or is it uh, addressing fin uh, height variability, or where, where do you see uh, the challenge for them on, in that regard? So I think the bigger challenges are really, uh, comes down to complexity and integration. Uh, in both of these areas, let's look at first on the uh, complexity side. The, uh, the number of steps have grown uh, for the FinFET. 
uh, and uh, that is actually uh, creating opportunities of course for us in terms of more layers uh, and uh, more steps that the uh, FinFats have to go through. And the second is on the integration. Uh, integration is uh, especially interesting because uh, the new materials are being injected, uh, the new, uh, new type of structure exists. So uh, the integration uh, part, which is mainly driven by our customers, uh, is extremely challenging. So uh, but the way I see this is really uh, the focus around uh, uh, complexity and uh, focus around integration. Uh, the way it would translate is uh, uh, the device performance yield and getting the device performance yield to the level that they need to be from the cost perspective uh, is where most of the emphasis will be as 3D of these new architectures come in. In some of our customers' cases in the development side, we already see uh, the impact pervasive for both complexity and integration. Uh, thank you. That was a good answer. The, the big question has always been on the side of lithography, and right now we're seeing uh, optical continue to extend to much further than we ever imagined. At the same time, EUV still seems to be a bit late to the party. What, what implications does that have for the industry? Does that mean more uh, process steps, more multi-patterning, or how do you interpret all of those particular events? You're absolutely right about the trends as we go forward and the impact of lithography. Uh, whether, uh, I take it this way, uh, the uh, push out for the EUV uh, has definitely put a uh, lot of uh, pressure around double patterning, quad patterning, and finding alternatives to uh, if the litho is not ready. Uh, so we are seeing a lot of activities from our customers as a result on the back end, especially back end of the line and interconnect formation. And uh, addition of the uh, double patterning, certainly on the customer side, it provides uh, uh, cost and integration challenges. Uh, and for us, therefore, uh, comes the business opportunity, but uh, with that also the responsibility to make sure that we accelerate their roadmap and fix the yield issues uh, and uh, make sure that the double patterning uh, related participation that we have in these devices, we do drive that hard. Uh, in the end, I think for the UV, uh, we see that maybe another load that will go on and this uh, demand of number of steps increase and double patterning, quad patterning trend uh, will continue. On top of all of the uh, uh, migrations to new transistor structures and lithography, we also have in the background a possible change in wafer size, that is to the 450 millimeter uh, fab. And currently, the industry is make, trying to make a shift to the fab to that wafer size, and although the ROI is in question as well as the R&D funding. And briefly, can you address where, we, where we're at in 450 and what will it take to get there? Well, I think the, uh, if we look at uh, uh, our industry going forward uh, for semiconductors, uh, let's look at first on inflections. Um, we have more inflections coming in next five years than we had in last 15. Uh, that is putting uh, the constraints, as you pointed out, uh, whether it is R&D investments or it is the overall return on investments as is. Uh, specific to 450, the way for scale change comes uh, uh, at a lot of R&D investments and uh, it also comes as uh, a challenge to create a business and have a return on it. Uh, and I think uh, the supply chain, uh, the ecosystem completely understands that, our, our customers understand that, we understand that. So uh, key requirements for uh, the industry are really to make sure that the timing of 450 is synchronized uh, and it is not uh, the lesson learned from 200 to 300 millimeter were really uh, to make sure that we are not wasting the R&D money and we are using the, um, the overall R&D as an industry, as a total supply chain in an effective way uh, across the whole footprint. Uh, that would be key requirement. The second is really that the lithography has to come through 
and the timing of it will be dictated by that. Uh, we as an industry need to therefore make sure of the following. Number one, that our timing as an industry is synchronized to bring it in. Number two, that the R&D wastage is not there and we are working to uh, assure that we are able to do it in a, such a way that uh, R&D is shared. And thirdly, uh, collectively we are able to create return on investments for our customers as well as for us to continue the most long. Let's go to some of the current challenges with current planar devices and the fact that, especially in the, the back end of the line, where we're seeing, shall we say, uh, major challenges in the interconnect, which have always been a challenge, of course, but as we're getting to these finer geometries, we're seeing a lot of issues with the uh, metallization and the uh, locate, so on and so forth. And we're also seeing the, the advent of this so-called RC uh, uh, prop up into the uh, equation. Tell us a little bit about that and what's happening on that front. On the interconnect overall, uh, as we discussed earlier regarding the trends in foundry and the logic driving the roadmap, uh, the wiring of the back end and the interconnect overall is extremely critical. We are seeing new requirements, whether these are related to the low key materials, uh, new material introduction, uh, changes in terms of the integration of the uh, interconnect, uh, several places where are a uh, lot of high value problems that we need to solve. Uh, the RC delay, as you know, significantly impacts the performance going forward, especially at the lower uh, geometries and structures. Now, uh, applied materials uh, historically have had a strong foothold uh, to solve the customer's problem in the back end. Uh, the interconnect starting from the copper uh, when a dual Damascene and these activities came in play uh, 10 years ago. I think since then there has been a good steady extension of the interconnect roadmap. But time has come because of uh, what you mentioned regarding RC delay and such challenges to see uh, whether it's low key materials uh, or it is uh, introduction of new materials or even it is some of the architectural changes, uh, contact resistance and other parameters uh, that are really, really becoming critical to define the overall RC uh, benefits as well as uh, to really restructure the interconnect uh, to the new requirements uh, 20 nanometer and below. So we are seeing a lot of actions and as I said, we are historically um, stronger in terms of uh, providing the solutions in the back end and uh, we will continue to do that. The back end or the issues with the interconnect are driving or perhaps fueling the interest in 3D structures, meaning you know whether it's stack devices or vertical man or, and give us a, a, a little bit of, insight as to what's happening on that front and how that benefits applied and when we'll see these devices. Um, uh, that's a uh, good indicator. I think that 3D is uh, one of the area uh, because of uh, the structural changes. Anytime we change any of the structure, the RC delay becomes uh, uh, one of the bigger factor to resolve. Uh, so uh, VNAND uh, or even the 3D other logic structures are key precursor to it. What we are ending up doing as a result is to go back to the drawing board and look at the basic simulation of the overall interconnect. So doing that, uh, what it is uh, uh, looking at is, in some cases for the 3D structures, you have to change the material. In some cases, you have to introduce uh, uh, new films uh, and uh, the etching becomes a challenge similarly uh, some of the ALD and CVD films are coming in play. So it's a whole uh, plethora of products uh, that is required to be reinvigorated uh, and a lot of innovation going on uh, for this, uh, for the interconnect formation. Indira, thank you very much for your time and uh, it was a pleasure to see you again. Thank you very much and uh, thanks for coming out today to Applied Materials and uh, for very interesting questions uh, during these exciting times for India.